Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures, home of the quarantined wargamer. I'm Big Lee and today I want to discuss some more techniques for solo play. So back in February I did a video extolling the virtues of solo wargaming and it proved to be quite popular. And in that video I listed several benefits you know, that immediately leapt off the top of my head, such as you know, it's, it's a great way to learn a new set of rules. You can take your time to enjoy a game. It's great training to help you think like the enemy, and it gives you some much needed tactical practice. And the video has been very popular indeed. Uh, clearly there's uh, plenty of interest out there in solo gaming, um, and hopefully that will continue long past lockdown when people get back into their clubs uh, and still want to do a little bit of solo play in between games down the club or with their friends. So today I thought what I'd do is look at some solo techniques in a little more detail than I did in the original video. So back in February I mentioned the use of chance or tactical cards um, as a great way of randomising multiple options. Um, now, now lots of board games use this method. I mean the most obvious example would be Monopoly. In fact if I remember rightly uh, Donald Featherstone actually says as much in his book Solo Wargaming. Um, and it's a great way of introducing unexpected events, both good and bad, into a game that could affect either side randomly. Um, but they are, by definition, completely random, and they work best if those effects are subtle rather than game changers. There should be a minor frustration or boon to either side. A fast horse, for instance, you know, you could have a card card saying fast horse, where the leader can move faster during this particular turn, or bad boots. Poor fitting shoes reduce the unit speed for the rest of the game. Um, lucky shooting, just this turn they get a plus one to their shooting bonus, a particular unit for instance. Confusion, a particular unit gets confused over its orders and doesn't move this turn for no apparent reason. Uh, pluck, unit gets a bonus in melee just this turn. Um, they've got the bit between their teeth and they fight a little bit more stubbornly. There's infinite variety in the, in the use of uh, chance cards. Um, it's really only limited by the imagination of the player writing those chance cards before the game starts. Now, the other advantage with ch using chance cards um, is that, that it's a great way of injecting a bit of narrative into a game because you can make chance cards as descriptive as you like. Um, you know, they can add a little bit of colour to that solo game and you can use them in regular games with other players as well so they're not just limited to solo games um, uh, but as I've already mentioned when you use chance cards they shouldn't be game changers the effects should be subtle that create an interesting moment a little bit of randomization at a particular point in a game they shouldn't completely change the outcome of, of, of the, the entire battle now another method uh, that is really good to be used, uh, and again I mentioned it in my previous video, um, is basically some form of programmed AI. Um, that could be a simple set of rules that basically govern how the enemy uh, units are going to behave when you're playing against them. Uh, a great example of that would be the rules in uh, the Mr. Babbage rules in the Men Who Would Be Kings. Um, and this describes how the enemy units will behave under certain conditions. You know, when faced with the enemy, this type of unit will always charge as their preference, for instance. Um, it makes for a very logical approach, um, and it makes the enemy fight sensibly. They're not going to do something completely bizarre and out of character. Um, uh, and therefore it means that they play in a much more realistic way. It feels more natural. The downside, of course, is that when you have programmed actions like this, it's very easy for you, as the uh, living player on the other side of the table, to predict what the enemy are going to do. Um, uh, so it, it works well when you use it, in it with a combination of other techniques, like chance cards that add a little bit more random element to it. Um, uh, but it's a, it is a, a useful one to think about, so I'd recommend having a look at the Mr. Babbage rules, they're really good, but you can write something yourself that uh, basically outlines how certain units are going to behave under certain conditions, and then you can play your game and you know that you're not making uh, a, a biased decisions for the enemy units because you're following that programmed set of instructions for them. And then there are some elements in a game, um, like things like reserves, terrain, or environmental factors, which can be randomised on, on a table or you, with a set of dice, to, so that they uh, avoid some predictability, add 
builds in a little bit more randomness to the way the game is going to run. So, for instance, reserves. You know, roll the entry point for where the reserves are going to come onto the table, or roll to see if they turn up at all. Um, it, it behaves in in many respects. It, it it sort of behaves in a similar way to like random encounter tables in role playing games. Um, you know, you don't know exactly what unit's going to appear where. Um, and that applies to both sides, both the person whose reserves they are and the enemy units. Um, but certainly you can use that for randomising the enemies, uh, you know, the, uh, the AI's um, bringing on of reserves. Um, and, and basically until that dice is rolled, it's a mystery to everyone exactly what's going to happen. You can do something similar with terrain, randomising the terrain. It, it often comes up in sets of rules when they talk about how to set up a table. You know, if you're using uh, uh, scenarios, there's often rules in there for randomising the terrain. So you roll for what types of terrain is going to be used and where it's going to appear. Um, added to that, I would say, um, if you're going to play a game like that, randomise which side of the table you're going to end up playing on, because that way no unconscious bias can get involved in the way that you set up the table. You know, uh, you know if you did place a piece of terrain thinking that would be helpful and then you roll the other side of the table it's your own fault so it should reduce any of that bias from seeping into the game um, and it can it, you know random terrain can create all sorts of tactical problems that they need to be overcome because sometimes that terrain won't necessarily be logical in some respects you know forget your geography and you know place it as the dice tell you to and, and then see what happens um of course, it can create disadvantages as well as advantages, but I guarantee you that whatever you do, it will be interesting. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of this section, you know, environmental factors can be randomised. So, in particular, weather conditions, for instance, you can use weather charts and dice. Now, I've used this in role-playing games, for instance, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't do exactly the same um, on a macro scale for a, a war game, particularly a larger game that might last all day, where the weather might change during the course of the day. It's often used in games involving ships, you know, sea-based games, where you want to change the wind direction. So you, there's, there's rules for rolling to see if the wind direction changes. Um, and in land games, of course, you can do it for, um, you know, the placement of fog, for instance, and where it's going to drift and that sort of thing. Um, uh, rain could be diced for to see whether it interferes with visibility and the, the terrain itself. You know, can it, is it going to make certain areas of the battlefield difficult going that perhaps were easier early in the game? Um, and of course, rain and, and, and weather conditions can also change the, the characteristics of rivers. So, you know, previously foldable rivers might only be foldable in certain areas, or perhaps those folds are completely closed. So again, if it's diced for and randomised, nobody knows what's going to happen, um, and it changes the tactical situation on the ground. It makes for a much more interesting game when you're playing against an AI, for instance, in a solo game. And one of my favourite rules is the, is the simplest. Basically, it's 50-50. When you're faced with a binary decision, do I do this or do that, roll a dice, toss a coin. Um, you know, this is my go-to option when I don't know what to do, really. It has the benefit of being simple and easily understood. However, of course, it lacks subtlety and fine detail, so don't overuse it. But it's a really good fallback option if you get a surprise situation um, and you really think that the enemy could behave in one of two ways. Just roll a dice or toss a coin to make that decision for you. And then there are some other methods that uh, I haven't really got time to go into in a great deal of depth. But there are other things that you can do, such as uh, random troop deployment. Now, you know, this is negatives and positives about it. Obviously, if you randomly deploy the, the enemy, we've got absolutely no idea where they're going to be. Um, uh, and then you, as the player that's going to be playing that AI in effect, have then got to try and make the best of wherever units end up. And it can be very illogical. You know, they could be deployed in completely the wrong way um, for that particular time period. So it does have some disadvantages. Um, another variation on that would be partial deployment, whereby you, you pick one unit that can be redeployed to one of the uh, sections of the army, whether that's a brigade or a corps or whatever. So subtly changing the balance of uh, their uh, the, the enemy's um, thrust of attack, in effect, you know, making one particular part of that army stronger than another area, might change the tactics that the, the AI are going to use and how you're going to tackle it. 
Um, so you know you could set up so that everything is nicely balanced and then you get this one unit that goes to a particular uh, section of the army, maybe it's a flank or a particular brigade, um, and that can change the dynamics of the game. So that's something to consider. But then you can also introduce, um, very similar to the chance cards, you can introduce uh, stuff to do with resupply, uh, uh, very similar to how you do the reserves in effect, where you would randomly determine where resupply comes on or if it comes on at all. Um, I mean, again, that can subtly change the dynamics of a game for both sides. Um, and then, on perhaps on a bigger scale, um, uh, you could introduce uh, strategy cards that basically determine after you've set up to face the enemy that is deployed in front of you, then you pull out some strategy cards which determine the strategy for the enemy. You know, that they're going to be aggressive or that they're going to go on the defensive or that they're going to try and attack a particular feature on that table. And that can be random. And then you, as the, the living player, have got to uh, react to that. Of course, the, the, the disadvantage of that is you know what the enemy's strategy is uh, from the get-go and you can uh, react to that. Um, whereas in reality, you would be guessing what is the strategy of the enemy um, uh, uh, until they sort of reveal reveal their plans to you. Um, so that you know that, that it, it can be useful, but it, it has some negatives because it's not completely. It's not like playing a, 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 another player uh, where you've got to try and second guess what they're trying to do. And then there's um, another area that I'm, I'm not really going to. I'm only going to briefly touch on today. There's probably a whole new separate video in this, and that is solo campaigns. Um, so um, some of the techniques that we've already looked at can be used on a more macro scale for for whole campaigns. Um, uh, things like randomising maps and locations of troops and directions of march and stuff like that, chance cards on a more macro scale that sort of determine the weather or the political situation or the supply, you know, wh whatever those issues might be. Um, uh, so there, again, this is an area that I need to sort of look into more. I've not done solo campaigning, so it's a bit hard for me to be able to comment on it here. But maybe there's a video in it in the future. Um, another idea that you might want to use, and it's something that um, my group, Postage Rejects, are currently uh, employing, is to use outside influences to play the game. So, in other words, what you do is you play the solo game, but you get somebody else to issue the orders for the enemy. Um, and they're not there. They just issue the orders so that you never know, you've got no input whatsoever in how the enemy behaves, but you've still got to react and play to it. Now, what the rejects are doing at the moment, there's five of us playing a game um, set in the Seven Years' War, um, and the sixth member um, is actually playing the game at his uh, home. Um, so we issue orders for our various brigades and, and so on, um, and then he has to enact those orders as best he can in the best interests of that particular army um, on, for both sides. And of course, we're directing the battle, but he has to uh, play it out. Now you could do it that he was playing one side and we all played the other side. In this particular version, we've got two sides playing against each other and he runs the game on his table. But you could just as easily have all those players playing separate brigades on one side and him on the other side. Um, of course, the downside of that would be that, he, again, he would know what the strategy of the enemy is and can react to it. Um, but I'm sure there are mechanisms that could be put in place that would make that uh, fairer. But certainly it's an option if you want a, a, an AI that acts with a, a certain degree of intelligence and certainly some logic. Um, uh, we won't mention strategy, strategic skill, but you know, it, it, at least it would be independent of yourself and then you could play the game accordingly. Now when playing solo games, I do have a set of golden rules, and I've mentioned them in some of my earlier videos. And, and I still think that they're worth uh, bearing in mind whatever other rules you use for determining how to operate the, uh, the enemy during a solo game. Be flexible. Solo rule, rules that work in one scenario or rule set won't always work in another. So find what works for that particular game or that particular rule set. And remember, no one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> There's no right or wrong way to, to do this, and if you make a mistake, you know, reset like you would in a computer game. Go back a stage and, and see if that changes. The ultimate rule when you're playing on your own, be prepared to cheat. Occasionally, what doesn't work, you know, you can t test something out without any judgment um, and, and see if that a different, a different way of doing things work. 
because as I said at the beginning, solo play is a great way to learn a new set of rules. And you might do something and go, oh, that, I didn't do that right, or I could have done that better. So reset slightly and do it again. So be prepared to cheat. No one's watching. And then, of course, I would always say is read the literature that's available. There's loads of books. Featherstone's a fantastic book on solo gaming, but there's lots of other stuff out there. Um, you know, uh, gaming blogs, YouTube videos, find whatever you can to give you some ideas about how to roll. And a lot of rules will include some element of uh, advice on solo play um, and randomising of certain elements of the game. So look out for those and try and implore them if you can. Well, I hope you found that interesting. And of course, if you did, please like, subscribe and share. So until next week, uh, get as many games in as you can, of course. Stay safe and keep rolling high.